How's it going, everybody? This is Dave Meltzer. We're going to be here for the next two hours talking pro wrestling. We've got Brian Alvarez here, and we're also going to be joined in about a half an hour by Les Stature. And, of course, those of you who have heard Les on the show, he's one of our best guests. Tremendous knowledge of wrestling, of every facet of wrestling. He's currently training wrestlers at the Heartland Wrestling Association. He's promoting uh, spot shows um, with his guys and occasionally with some big names from the WWF. And uh, long-time wrestling announcer. One of the wrestling announcer is someone you can talk to about it because done it all over the country. He's uh, wrestled for over 20 years. Goes back as a fan to the 50s. So history, just, man, this, you can call back anything you want. Current, you know, it's going to be a good day. So anyway, want to get that out of the way. Also, uh, want to thank everybody for the feedback on yesterday's show. We got tremendous feedback on uh, the show. Like, everybody thought that it was like a, a really, I did a good job as an interviewer, which I don't know if that's my strong suit. Um, uh, I think my knowledge of wrestling is probably my strong suit, not necessarily the interviews, but I guess it's real easy when you're just blabbing with a friend, you know. I mean, I don't know if I could have done that with somebody else, so so that was pretty cool. And the thing on the website, which we got some good feedback on, so that was cool. Brian, how are you today? I'm doing good. Good. We will start talking about SmackDown. Um, I want to start on this one. You know, I I um, a lot of people will will ask, you know, like uh. The fact that you know what's going on ahead of time, does that hurt your enjoyment of the product or that hurts my, you know, you know, and, and thinking that it does. And you know what? It really doesn't. Um, in almost all cases, and last night I would probably be the exception to that rule. Um, you know, I think my whole life, practically, as far as me getting videotapes of wrestling or watching wrestling, I always knew, you know, wrestling up until recently has never been like a live television show. You know, whenever you watch wrestling on TV, it was always taped. Uh, in most cases, ahead of time. I mean, I did the Spanish International Network thing in L.A. Actually, was was live for a while here. But um, you know, Raw. In fact, Raw was taped. You know, three out of four weeks back in the in the early 90s when it first started. Primetime wrestling was all tape matches. So you basically, I you know, every Japanese tape I ever got was at least a week after it happened. You know, or five days, whatever it takes to mail. So you know, I was always used to knowing finishes and knowing. Uh, what was going on before I saw it, and that's just how I got used to watching wrestling. So it's not like, you know, it was a negative. It was only in the co last couple of years with Raw and Nitro going both live every week that, you know, there was a lot of unpredictability and everything. And I, I don't know that it made it any any better or worse, really. Um, good match is still a good match. Bad match is still a bad match. Live, you know, you don't have the advantages of editing, but there's certain spontaneity. But anyway, last night's SmackDown, I really think I would have thought that it was a really good show if I didn't know what was going on, except for I would have hated the finish. So instead, I, since I knew where it was going, I was just like, the main storyline I didn't like, but I mean, I liked the, I liked the wrestling matches. Um, and I would have liked the show, except for I just thought that building that whole show up for that swerve, to me, it, it like weakens the characters. And um, I, I don't know, I just the, that whole last you know Monday-Thursday thing, with the Undertaker's wife and all that, it's just there was something about it that was so uh, unrealistic lame. that lame couldn't just couldn't get. It. I'm not, obviously I'm not the only one that thinks that because almost everyone thinks that. And I, I, you know you can't sink when you can't sink your teeth into a storyline. I mean I would it, it's better not to have it. It's actually much better. Anyway, Brian, what were your thoughts on the show? I mean I thought the show was pretty good until about the last ten minutes and I got depressed again as usual, but. I mean, watching it, I liked all the little skits that they did because I thought, I thought Hunter did a really good job. I thought Austin did a pretty good job, especially the one segment where him and Hunter were having their face off and Austin caught him in the lie. And, you know, Deborah and Stephanie were horrible. But, I mean, overall, Regal was awesome. I thought it was a good build. And, of course, at the end, they had to do the swerve. And I thought that was just horrible. And, I mean, the whole thing to me was it was like, it was a show that was written by, like, two different people that were on completely different pages because. The whole build-up to the swerve was like the total Vince Russo storyline that really does nothing for the company except make the baby face look like an idiot, uh, water down the heels for when, you know, one of these days Hunter's going to turn, and we talked about it a little while ago, no one's going to believe it because he's done this so many times. And uh, then they had what I thought was the most brilliant angle, and that was with Benoit and Kurt Angle and the gold medals. And I thought whoever wrote that was just an utter genius because... As much as I don't like the ladder match deal for the pay-per-view, at least they have an issue, and at least they have something at stake there, and it's Kurt Angle's gold medals. And he's worn them since day one, and he always talks about how much he loves them and everything like that. And, 
I mean, normally it would be like anything else, like the European title, which nobody really cares about. The wrestlers don't look like they really care about it. They just hold it and everything like that. And I mean, even I used to get mad with the uh, world title when Ultimate Warrior used to just throw it around like it was a Frisbee. And I just thought, you know, why should anyone care about this belt if this guy's just throwing it around like it's a toy? And even last week when uh, Undertaker took over Steve Austin's dressing room and he had the belt in there, Steve Austin did not care enough about that belt to go in and try and get it himself. He had to think of some sort of plan to try and get this belt back from Undertaker. And last night, Kurt Angle wanted those gold medals so badly that he actually went into a man's pants to get them out. He reached into Chris Benoit's trunks, and he pulled out these gold medals. And I thought, you know, there is nothing that they could have done to make these medals seem more important to Kurt Angle. And then it got even better as Benoit puts them in the crossface, and as much as Kurt Angle loved these gold medals, he had that to tap good. out because of the crossface. They put over the medals like nothing else. They put over that crossface like nothing else. And I just thought that was so awesome. And I, I couldn't even comprehend that somebody came up with that storyline. And then someone came up with the storyline in the main event, which was the same stupid swerve that nobody cares about that we've seen 18 million times. I would, I would without knowing who's writing what, I would bet that they were two different people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, that's just what I would say. I think it's pretty much a given. Uh, yeah, but no, that one, that spot where he was just so desperately not wanting to tap and drop those medals, and he did, tremendous. <laughs> it's just, uh, he's just staring at the gold medals as he's got his hand up there, and it was awesome. Yeah. Oh, I, you know, a lot of good wrestling. That match was a good match. Um, the Hardys and Eddie Guerrero, Malenko Saturn, and Jerry Lynn was a very good wrestling match, especially Eddie Guerrero. You know, just uh, really He was awesome. awesome. Yeah, really strong. Uh, Spike Dudley and Bob Holly wasn't too bad. I mean, considering the size difference and everything, Spike Dudley, except for his kicks, I thought he was, uh, he was quite good. And, and quite frankly, except for the finish of the match itself, as just a, as just a main event with Undertaker involved, Hunter did a great job. That was a good match. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Edge match with, uh, Chris Jericho was a good match. Uh, yep. the Big Show match with Bradshaw was not a good match. A bad match. <laughs> And uh, the China match was goddamn hideous. <laughs> oh, God. You know, they did the same thing again. It's China, Molly, and Ivory. And I didn't count, but it was like she sold maybe one move and just totally crushed him. And just like I laughed at him. And, you know, God made. I, I mean, when I'm watching that, I'm just thinking, like, you know, I never want to watch Ivory again. You just, <laughs> like, what's the purpose? You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, I mean, she has good facials and all that, but it's just like, I just don't, you know, the RTC things run its course anyway. I, I don't know. Um,. I mean, lead is really over, um, but it's like every time I watch a wrestle, it, it loses it, and the rest of those women, I, I mean, I, I get a kick and out of And the stuff she's doing with China just drags her down. Yeah. Well, but they got to do it if she's going to get the belt at some point, which obviously, you know, they're going to turn China heel and do a chase, and she'll get the belt, and um, they'll do their, they're going to do their storyline, and it's something to do with China, whatever. I mean, you know, China's an over personality. It's, oh, God, I can't stand watching her. What can I say? We'll, we'll go through the, the lineup for the pay-per-view. It's um it's a really interesting show in the sense that I think a lot of stuff is going to be rushed because even though it's only seven matches, it's actually 14 falls because the tag team elimination is going to be a series of matches. You know, and I just got a feeling we're going to get a, a whole bunch. You know, it's going to be six different matches um, with um, Edge and Christian Dudley's, uh, Hardy's X Factor, APA, Malenko and Saturn, and Chris Jericho and the Mystery Partner, and you know, keep going until. Um, a singles match is like a gauntlet deal, and then the final winner of the final match will wrestle, theoretically, um, Hunter and Austin, I'm guessing, on, on Raw the next night in San Jose. Uh, Just the whole so problem know. is, look at the uh, gauntlet match they did with the Cruiserweights and WCW on Thunder. I mean, they gave those guys a lot of time, and it still was rushed. Yeah, but that was yeah, almost 20 minutes, didn't they? It was like 18, 19 minutes, but that's a hell of a match. This one, Yeah, but still, it seemed like you know everyone was getting like a minute or two minutes in there. Yeah, and, and that's one thing is like there's a whole bunch of two minute matches, and also the other thing when I look at this lineup, um, I mean X Factor is new in that you know Justin Credible's new, uh, but um, when you look at like all the guys in here, and they're gonna probably I would guess they'll put that match on first just because it's kind of kind of where you would put a hot opener, that it's like all of those guys have basically had, some of them had not so good matches like the APA, Edge and Christian, the Dudleys and the Hardys have had. Great matches, but here they are, Edge and Christian, the Dudleys and the Hardys, that have been feuding with each other for over a year, and here they are in a pay-per-view, again, you know, in the exact same spot. And it's, it's like I look at this, and it's like total stagnation, and, and that's not good. Um, I mean, the only thing they could do with it that would elevate anybody would be uh, put the Hardys over 
And then Hardys are uh, going up against Hunter and Austin after and, everything that and they Hunter. went through and finally beat him for the belts. Yeah, but if the problem is for them and, and anyone. Someone's going to beat Hunter and Austin for the belts because it doesn't make any sense for them to have all those belts for so long. But the team that does it, they really need to beat them as opposed to, you know, getting their hand raised on a fluke because, you know, what good does that do? But, but who in the company is going to do that except Undertaker and Kane? Well, we're going to find out, I guess. Uh, let's see. The show did a 4.0, which, considering that Friends did, uh, what did Friends do? 18.7. Um, pretty good rating. And actually, I think, you know, even though Raw's numbers, there's no sign of a turnaround in Raw. It's dropped every week. SmackDown, by all rights, should start going up. Now, I don't mean that it will, but SmackDown should start going up next week because there's, you know, NBC's going to be in reruns for the rest of the summer um, until September or whatever. And, uh, CBS, CSI had their final episode last night. Everyone had their final episode. There's no more Survivor. There's nothing. There's basically going to be not a whole hell of a lot new on Thursday nights, and uh, it should go back up. So anyway, we will see if it does. Uh, we have a poll question right now, which is, um, which of these matches will make you most want to watch um, or, or, or buy Judgment Day, watch Judgment Day, whatever? A is uh, Austin Undertaker, B, Helmsley and Kane, C, Benoit Angle, D, Tag Team Elimination Match. I did not put... Uh, the Rhino match in there, and E will not be watching the show. Um, yeah, they they made the uh, the match which was going to be Test and Big Show. They have added Rhino to it for the Hardcore title, which is just, I mean, I guess it's the same. It doesn't matter. Raw. Whether in, what? Raw match. Yeah, and Lita in China. I mean, they'll probably keep it short. I guess is the only thing I could say. Regal and Rikishi. I just assume not even watch that. I mean, there's some about that match I don't want to see it. Um, <laughs> And, uh, by, by the way, uh, that Regal thing as Babyface last night was quite awesome, too. Yes, it was. When, when he was Talk about getting a guy over as a badass. Yeah. Yeah, that was, uh, that was good. And then, um, Angle and Benoit, you know, I, I don't like the fact that we, we got it, we did two out of three fall match, and then we did a most falls match, which went however many, seven falls. So we've done so many, you know, two out of three fall match with Helmsley and, and Austin, a couple pay-per-views back. Then we had the seven-fall match, um, the last pay-per-view. So the multiple fall thing has been done too much. The um, And I'm not even including the for those people in England that actually saw this thing in two out of three falls a couple weeks ago. Um, and then the multiple stipulations in the falls, I don't think add to it because the first two falls, like the you know one fall, there's going to be no submissions that are going to mean anything. So you're taking away part of the arsenal. The second one, none of your near falls are going to mean anything because you can't do them. So you're handicapping two falls. The third fall is the ladder fall, which will, you know, I mean, you know, they may do a hell of a match. They're two excellent wrestlers. They'll probably have the best match on the card, and it is the match I'm looking forward to the most. But the ladder problem is, is that you know, you go in there in a ladder match, and you do not have one incredible match. People are going to be let down because the ladder matches that they've seen on the last couple of pay-per-views. First of all, there've been too many of them, and then second, the quality of them has been through the roof. I mean, and they're not going to do. I mean, the one thing with the Benoit and Jericho ladder match that was so good was that they did a wrestling match and did a few ladder spots. Um, and then the last one with uh, Edge and Christian and those guys, they did those crazy spots. And, God, I hope that Benoit and Jericho don't try I mean, Benoit and Angle don't try to top that. But that's what people think of a ladder match. So it's, you know, if they pull this off, and they very well may, uh, my, more power to them. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Should WWF introduce character? When should the WWF introduce the characters from WCW? This was our poll for yesterday. Twenty-five percent say now, and maybe sooner than later. Thirty-four percent say over the summer, and forty-one percent say a week or two before launching the television show, which probably makes the most sense. Which probably also means that uh, it won't be the way it's done. Uh, Jericho has the mystery partner. Uh, Why well, you think it's going to be? I you know. Actually, you know what? I don't because I just look back at all the other horrible mystery partners and I just see uh, somebody that we will all groan about. Maybe not. Maybe not. I don't know. Ken Shamrock. How's that sound? I don't think he's uh, ready though. <laughs> I don't think just throw a name out. Uh, let's see. Um, got the Ross report in front of me too, which I have not actually had a chance to read, um, but I just got it uh, sent. Or actually, I just pick, picked it up right before we went on here. Uh, let's see. He's got some stuff on Ohio Valley. He was there on Wednesday. Let's see what he's got to say. Let's see. He's talking about the pay-per-view. Um, he expects the main event, and he knows, to be an old-school-style match. Unfortunately, I don't care what Austin Undertaker do. We've already seen it. 
Triple H and Kane will be a uniquely physical match and feature some innovations with the chains. So he says hopefully that'll be good. Benoit and Angle will definitely be very good to excellent. Uh, so that's good. Lita and China seems to have some interest and should be solid. Well, good luck. <laughs> the nice triple try. threat hardcore match features three young men who need to deliver the goods <laughs> on a show that would that's be... That's not very nice to say about Rhino. Breakthrough effort. Um... Rhino's doing very well. And I think Test is doing okay. Big Show isn't, has not been doing well. He needs Rikishi to live Regal, with And he goes, Rikishi Regal's hard to figure because of Rikishi's injured shoulder. But the effort will be there. And Tag Team oh, Terminal match. This could be the sleeper of the show. It depends on the final three teams and how well they utilize their in-ring time, which in other words means they're probably going to be rushed. Um, he says that we had a good week preparing for the relaunch of WCW. The talent roster is beginning to come together. Several unsigned talents have expressed desire to be part of the new WCW. We'll hopefully be on board to take advantage of being a vital part of the relaunch. I think that means Canyon, Billy Kidman, Page, Scott Steiner, Booker T, uh, maybe Rob Van Dam, um, because several verbal commitments have been made and contracts are being finalized over the next few days. I, I, you know, so those, those are the names I'm thinking. I don't know if there's anyone else there. He said he went to the Ohio Valley television taping Wednesday night. Uh, which he says he always enjoys. It reminds him of going to the uh, Irish McNeil Boys Club in Shreveport and uh, Tulsa Fairgrounds in the old days of Mid-South Wrestling over 20 years ago. Yeah, it's not quite. Does Cornette make people go back and forth from the heel and babyface locker room carrying notes for the guys? That I don't know. Good question. Um, when uh, we get uh, Next time we get an Ohio Valley guy, we'll, we should ask that. Uh, he goes, Jim Cornette is coming into the present somewhat reluctantly as part of his personal philosophy of business is concerned. <laughs> However, no one does a better job of doing an exciting TV show with basically an experienced crew than Cornette. Which actually, I mean, fundamentally, that's a um, pretty solid television show. And it is, the reason it may remind people of the old Irish McNeil shows is that he books the exact same way. I mean, I'm listening <laughs> to this, and it's like I could close my eyes, and, 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 and every word that Jim Cornette says is what Bill Watts would have said in 1984. <laughs> and the characters are the same, and, and the booking is the same, and the, the um, what's the word I'm looking for? The philosophy is identical, which it's not the worst thing in the world, believe me. I'd rather have that than most of the philosophies we've seen in wrestling since then. He goes, his passion, uh, this is about Cornette, his passion for old school values is genuine and good for these young talents to understand and respect. Danny Davis has my utmost respect as a credit to the product. Bobby Eaton will stay in OVW through August, perhaps longer, should prove to be a valuable resource. So they have obviously have not decided on what they're going to do with Bobby Eaton. And he goes, I was impressed by several. It's and still longer was, than the eight weeks, though. Yeah, August. I guess it would be, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, oh, good. So he got an extension. Uh, he, he mentioned Nick Dinsmore graduated from college last week. He's impressed with him, which Nick's a solid worker. Rico Constantino, of course, we've talked about him. I think Rico Constantino is just about ready to make the, the jump somewhere. Flash Flanagan, he mentioned in a positive, and of course Randy Orton, who everybody uh, has been, you know, Randy Orton's just got a good look. You know, he's like six four, six five, good physique, and and coming along at a very good pace. Mentions Leviathan with an awesome look um, and unlimited potential, which in fact he does. He's just, you know, the work needs a lot of work. Uh, standing there, I mean, he's a big guy with a very freakish physique. Uh, Shelton Benjamin, Brock Lesnar, he said we'll both be on Raw someday, which they will. Ron Waterman has been a pleasant surprise and looking better. Yeah, I said that too. I think I did in this week's Observer. Ron Waterman's definitely shown improvement. Uh, says Eric Angle had a towards tricep. Kind of praised some uh -oh. of the other guys. Um, and uh, mentioned uh, the solo, which is the the Rock, the dude, the dude that looks like the Rock, so much like the Rock, it is unbelievable. He broke his ankle on Thursday. I. Uh, and uh, let's see. Just Zero man suit OVW. out there? What, yeah. Because everyone at OVW is on a separate timeline, and they all know what areas they need to concentrate on. Um, there is no shortage of heart and dedication within the next 12 to 18 months. It seems inevitable to me that some of these men will be performing in the WF or WCW, maybe some, maybe sooner. He uh, goes, we're really going to focus on this area even more than in the past. Changes will be considered. Uh, competition is going to be more intense. So anyway, that's what he says there. I don't think there's any other big... No mention of Mike Bell, huh? Mike Bell, no, no mention of Mike Bell and Perry Saturn, no, not at all. Hmm. That's supposed to be a, um, although his daughter uh, is getting married next Saturday, Jim Ross' daughter, Casey. Congratulations to her. And it also mentioned that he really likes Kurt Angle's book. Um, some minor changes are being made as we speak. In other words, he said something uh -oh. he didn't like. But this is going to be a surprisingly good read. 
which if you remember when, when he talks about books, he doesn't overly praise the bad ones. So Actually, I always figured that the uh, Kurt Angle book would be really good. I mean, he's had an interesting life. Yeah. Um, and very successful. He was, he was, I was intrigued by Kurt's Olympic journey and the drastic measures he endured to compete during the biggest week of his life. Talking about the murder of uh, Dave Schultz, who's a famous amateur wrestler from, from here in San Jose area, as a matter of fact. And his entrance into sports entertainment goes not as deep as Foley is good, but an extremely interesting and informative look. That's the main stuff that he talked about. Um, let's it's been hard to be as deep as uh, Foley's book with only two years in pro wrestling. Oh, well, I guess he had a whole Olympic career to talk about. Yeah, not as deep as pro wrestling part. Because Kurt's still pretty naive, I think, when it comes to pro wrestling. I mean, as far as, um, <laughs> you know, certain aspects of it and everything like that. Um, yeah. Um, and Foley is not. I tell you what, you know, I read your transcript, you know, because I heard the first half hour of the Foley chat yesterday. And I got I give him a lot of credit. I mean, I, I mean, the one thing about Foley is, is that when it comes to, like, watching wrestling, not, not necessarily wrestling itself, but when it comes to watching and evaluating wrestling, whenever I read like the, for the first Foley book, the second Foley book, or or talk to him, or or um, or what, that chat, his views and my views, it's like it's like it's almost like Brian. Our, our views are are very very similar. That's why I kind of want him to be on the writing team. <laughs> 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 because I mean, you know, like all of the things that we talked about on the show that are wrong. I mean, he. He's not going to blast the product, obviously, but every one of them... He made mention out. of everything. It was kind of creepy. Every single thing we talk about, he made... That's right. He made mention of. Um, you know, what needed to be done, um, what the, pro the, the problems were. I mean, you know, clearly that, you know, he didn't... He didn't, didn't he pretty much say that that storyline with Undertaker was lame? He pretty much... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, anyway. the thing is... I, the thing I like about Foley is he wrote the first book, he wrote the second book, and he even said, you know... I wrote some things about Vince that were not too flattering, and he did not take him out. He was cool with it. And I think yeah. that once that happened, Foley realized, well, I guess I can uh, say some things that maybe some other guys can't say, and he sure has. But he does it in a nice way. But, you know, he can't get heat, though. I mean, yeah, he doesn't bury it or anything like that, but he gives his views, and he's honest about it. Yeah, but you, I don't think that you can give that guy heat for because of everything that he's done. And, and also... To me, you know, now, if, if I was the WWF and I was Vince McMahon, I would hire this guy to be, you know, my public relations person. I wouldn't put Linda out there. I wouldn't, certainly wouldn't, wouldn't have Vince go out there himself. Like, whenever there's, like, a fire, I would put him out there because he speaks very well. He's a likable guy. Um, I know some people would be concerned over the, the, the appearance, you know, because he's kind of disheveled and everything like that. But I think I would overlook that because I think he comes, Well, you know, that, you know. He is. Yeah. yeah, no, he is. He is. But, I mean, I think that, like, of all of the guys in the WWF, uh, when, when it comes to going in front of the public, I mean, like, the top, most of the top stars are too much characters, so they couldn't do it. And, you know, like, they, and, and, they're, and the people kind of want him to be. He is, like, the real person, and he's a very good defender of wrestling because he, he believes it, you know? And he believes everything. And the other good thing about Foley is he does, like, a ton of research, and he knows what he's talking about. And, you know, we were talking about Bob Costas and Vince. If Bob Costas really would have known what to ask Vince, he could have really got him. And you can't do that with Foley, because Foley's not going to say things that he knows are not true. He's going to talk about stuff that he's researched, and he's going to have a uh, comeback for anything you ask him. He has researched so much stuff in the last year or two. Um, I tell you, I'm, I'm so impressed. He goes to the library all the time, because and, and, and we, were we were talking about certain things, and, I mean, he is ready, you know, like when he's going on this book tour, you know, I mean, he's ready with research and everything for any question that's going to be asked. <laughs> and, and, yep. and, and, and I mean, and he's not going to get caught with his pants down, so to speak. Uh, let's see. Real quick, um, today at uh, Sapporo, Japan, Mitsuharu Misawa retained the uh, Global Honored Crown. i got to get used to that one. It's a new one. It's the first title defense, beating Kiritawe. And also, the Super Junior Tournament started today at Corican Hall. I heard they had a hell of a show. Silver King over Chris Candido. Uh, Silver King. <laughs> Shocker over Dr. Wagner. That's a, <laughs> Shocker Dr. Wagner's probably a pretty good match, too, Lucha style. Uh, Jushin Liger against Wataru beat Wataru Inoue, and Minoru Tanaka beat Shinya Makabe, which I heard was a hell of a match. And they also taped um, one of the biggest uh, primetime television shows in Japan was taping there because uh, one of the female leads of the show, I guess, had a, is doing a, a, an episode where she has a crush on Keiji Muto. And uh, what else there? Oh, well, Triple A is going to be at the Olympics tonight in L.A. If anyone's down in L.A., uh, I'm actually very curious to see how they draw and how the show is. I would, um, if I wasn't here, I actually would be kind of curious to go to that show. Um, except, except I 
some of those triple A matches are a little too deep for me, and they are doing a women's match, and that's pretty darn scary. Oh. <laughs> I heard the women were on again this week. Yeah. Some look I mean, crazy, you know. It was it was so weird about um about Mexico and, and Japan. I mean, and I don't I don't know how to I don't know why this is. Maybe someone can explain it. But as everyone knows, the Japanese women wrestlers are phenomenal, and the Japanese midget wrestlers are terrible. The Mexican midget wrestlers are phenomenal, by and large. There's obviously exceptions, and the Mexican women wrestlers, by and large, are terrible. And in the United States, um, they're all they're all everybody's bad. terrible. <laughs> Everyone's bad except for the men. Yeah, uh, this is from Matt, who goes based on overall talent. Would you say Kawada is better or just as good as Triple H or Chris Benoit? I think Kawada is more talented in the ring than than Triple H for sure, and uh, Benoit. I would say that they're pretty equal. It's hard for me to say who's better. Um, they both have different strengths. I mean, Kawada is better at doing a believable match. Not that Benoit is not good at that. I don't know. They're they're awesome. Last they're night good. I was ready to put Eddie Guerrero above both of them. Eddie Guerrero was awesome last night. Boy though, boy is Eddie Guerrero getting big though. <laughs> he is. He's just like blowing up every week on my TV. Uh, also, can Kawada cut a promo? N not like the guys here. The Japanese, the promos are not nearly as important as they are here. The guy who can cut a promo over there is, so they tell me, is Chono. Cause I don't understand a word of what they say, but he always seems to get a rise from the crowd. So I guess he can. Uh, let's see. It's from someone who said he's really mad that Chris Jericho was not chilling, selling the concerto from Edge and Christian enough last night. Um, yeah, I think he was doing a pretty good job. Yeah. Or he was just uh, depressed for real. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, let's see what we got here. What are the odds of WF not relaunching WCW on its own? I mean, there's I can't give you odds. It's like if they don't come to a TV deal, it, then th there is that chance. I mean, I, everyone's going full steam ahead with the idea that they're relaunching it. Um, by the way, I don't know why Linda McMahon said two or three weeks. I, I'm just under the assumption. Um, I, I'll, I'll tell you this. Um, I actually talked to, uh, uh, I guess I can say this because it's Vince knows. But anyway. But, but Vince's secretary, who's like my intermediary, uh, when, when I have questions for Vince, and I called up, and she goes, we've been waiting all day for you to ask this question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have an answer. But yeah, you just have a hotline that you'd call that would have like a recording to save everybody some trouble. Ask anyway? I know, right. I know, it's funny. It's funny because, because they go, ever since she said that, we were just waiting for your phone call. <laughs> and, um, but as far as like why, I, I, don't, I don't know what... what Maybe she just said it, you know? Maybe she was just up there and they said, when's it going to start? And she goes, oh, we're going to do some stuff two to three weeks. Yeah, I, I actually think that that's, uh, I actually think that that's the answer. So anyway, we got, uh, well, let me just, uh, let's look at that. Um, let's see what else. Seeing as WWF is fired, unless you believe the story that he resigned, one of their writers, yeah, Jamie Morris, got dumped. Um, I can't help but wonder what would happen if a person on the writing staff who seemed completely burned out or was devoid of very creative ideas was none other than Stephanie McMahon herself. I'm not, I, I tell you what. When it comes she to won't be writing, fired anytime soon. No, she will not be fired. But as far as like, um, you know, there's there's uh, four or five guys or six guys that are doing that writing. And as far as who does what, I mean, I pretty much have a decent idea because I know his style of, of Paul Heyman. And I think I got a pretty decent idea of, of, of um, Stephanie McMahon a little bit. Um, but the rest of them, like, you know, um, I, I don't really don't know their writing style because I don't know the people. So, you know. Um, I don't know who's burned out, who's not contributing, who is, who's contributing to bad ideas. I, I, I really can't say. We got Les Thatcher on the line. Les, how are you doing today? All right. How about you guys? Hey. Doing very, very good, Les. Great, great. Uh, I've been waiting, waiting to have you on all week. Oh. <laughs> Am I in so trouble? Was, what? Am I in trouble? Oh no, 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 okay. no, 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 no. Just because uh, you, you know, you've got. You're, you're a good guest. Honest. I'm a good. You're oh, a thank good. you, Brian. You're a good you're a good guest and you, you you have the two you have the two good qualities in that you have all the experience of watching wrestling longer than any of us and number two you still watch it. I mean, we, had, we, had Nick, we had like Nick Bockwinkel on and Nick Bockwinkel uh, to me was a tremendous guest last week, but Nick Bockwinkel you know really doesn't watch wrestling anymore. So I mean his stories were awesome about the 70s and then the, the early 80s, but uh, to a lot of fans you know the. You know, he's talking about Ray Stevens and stuff. It does they don't really relate to that. But you can talk to, about Ray Stevens and relate to Chris Benoit or something. So it's, I don't know. That's, no, I know what you're saying too. Yeah, a lot of our generation, uh, you know, uh, actually don't work in the industry anymore. So they very uh, you know, few. Take pardon. 
Very few. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I get chastised sometimes for my stance, but, I, you know, if you work in the business, you've got to change with the times. <laughs> you got to. You really do. Yes. You, you you can't be in the past. I mean, how, how's Cornette doing with that, by the way? Ross kind of made a comment that he's he's finally kicking in. I know you, you had Cornette on your show over the weekend. Uh, yeah. yeah Jimmy's, uh, Jimmy does real well. I mean, yeah. did you see the tape we sent you? Yes, I did. I watched this morning of um, of Craig Zellner or Ray Steele, and um, that was a good match. Yeah, I thought it was, too. Yeah. I thought nice. it was, too. And then we got the report that somebody posted that said uh, some indie worker was in over his head. It wasn't quite that. No, I mean, I mean, I, no, I'll tell you what I, what I, what I wrote, and it was a guy who uh, sent me the report. It was not a knock on on Ray Steele, but it was just that, like, you know, he wasn't at Benoit's league, and you know, right? I mean, hey, five guys are, you know what I mean? And then <laughs> half the guys in the WWE, in fact, exactly. most of the guys in the WWE aren't in Benoit's league. Exactly. Yeah, oh, there's only three or four who are. Yeah. So, you know, so, Chris, but, but uh, I mean, I, Chris gave yeah. uh, Ray the ultimate compliment here. I, you know, a lot of people aren't uh, aren't understanding of the etiquette in our industry, but he allowed Ray to call a few spots. Uh, in the ring, so I thought that was a tremendous compliment for a young man who's, uh, you know, uh, he's actually from the time he walked in my my camp uh, has only been at this about two years total. Yeah, and I think you know everybody's high on him. Uh, he worked with Jerry Lynn. Jerry was uh, high on him. Uh, Malenko and Chris has been watching him too, and uh, you know Chris sees him sees him growing too with every outing. So uh, you know, and Corny gave him a good re review. And I told him, I said, listen, if you think I'm critical, if Jimmy thinks the match is bad, you will hear about it. <laughs> no, he, 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 he did a good job. And I mean, like, I hadn't seen him wrestle in, in several months because I haven't seen his TV matches in WWF. But, um, and again, you know, he's in there with Benoit. But, I mean, it was like, wow, you know, big improvement in the last yeah. couple months. Yeah. Big, I mean, big improvements. He did really good there. Yeah. There's a, great... there's, a, Go ahead. there's a lot of guys. Um, around, you know, and Cornette's got a bunch of them in his camp, and then there's independent guys. We we have several of them here in California that are are are, are really. It's funny they're turning into really solid workers, but there's that thing. It, it, I don't know how to explain. It. It, it's like there's there's a um, that superstar aura. I mean, on an indie level, but I mean, it's, it's a certain thing that like technically in the ring they're good. Right. But when I look at them, I also don't, I don't know if it's experience or maybe not doing interviews, um, you know, and, and the fact that they're performing for, you know, you, you know, because they're not superstars, they don't get a superstar reaction. Like, you, you know what I mean? Like, you don't get that feel that they're going to walk into the WWE. I'm afraid they're going to walk into the WWF and become just guys on the roster. I think the guys on the roster. Yeah, you know I what I mean? The, yeah, I think the difference between uh, making it there and just, Flounder, you know, and doing what we're talking about, an indie superstar is just being a mechanical man. I, I, th I think the guys that make it uh, have a sense of actually the timing of what they're doing uh, more intricately. What I mean by that is, you know, uh, where you and I are working a match, where are we in this match? And I'm able to, you know, in terms of my mind, build myself into that time frame and sell for you uh, in an ideal manner or come back at the ideal time. Uh, the body language and everything. I think a lot of the kids today learn the moves, but they're just very mechanical. And I think one of the things I th see with race, and I think one of the things some of the uh, veterans that have watched him on the dark matches and stuff say, is the fact that he's he does he, you know he wants to work the people and he's willing to learn and he goes out there and gets some heat instead of just going out there and going through his mo through the motions. And I think that's the difference of getting there and staying there, opposed to just getting looked at. You know, you you know, I thought about that about Chris Candido. He always looked like a robot in there, like he was connecting the dots. Yeah, yeah, I've seen Chris do that. But you know, I've seen Chris with a, with another good worker. You know, where he comes to life too. Uh huh. And I think I think that's one of the things. You know, uh, everybody talks about how Flair can can make another wrestler, and I think a lot of guys, you know, maybe they don't have that it thing <laughs> as much as Flair has. But I think, you know, there's, I think Ben Waz, you know, I've heard people say, well, Ben Waz, as long as he works with somebody good, and I don't see that. I mean, Chris, <laughs> as long as there's someone to carry him. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's like, a, yeah, I mean, like, just, you know, I mean, I, I, I've watched the guy for like 15 years with people ranging from absolutely awful to absolutely phenomenal, and, and he almost never has a bad match. No. No, so. and, and, you know, but, but, you know, and I think as far as what he has, if you get to know Chris, 
this guy, I mean, you know, it, it's like takes so much pride in his work, uh, loves what he does, just want, you know, and is never satisfied. Because there's been times that I'd watch him on a pay per view and call him and say, hey, man, it was a really great match here, blah, blah, blah. And he'd say, well, yeah, but. And then he'd start to say, I should have done, you know, then here I could have. And, and I think that's the quality that makes Flair Flair or, or Ben Wall. Or, well, as far as that goes, Helmsley or Austin, you know, is the fact that they go out there and always trying to top themselves and care. It's not just a job. They just don't go out there for the money. I mean, my God, it, the kind of money we're talking about there, you know, you'd think, why don't they even try to walk on water? But, I mean, in actuality, I think that's something, a quality, a trait that a performer has in our industry. If they're going to make it, they've got to have that. And I think that... Oh, you- not something maybe you always put a number on or a tag on, but that's what it is. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I want to talk about that, that. I think that's the difference between getting there and getting to the top and being one of the best guys is the idea that, you know, you can't be motivated by your paycheck. You have to be motivated by something that's in you. You have to have that drive because the guys who make it to the top, I mean, every one of them is, has had those periods where they haven't necessarily had a good paycheck, except for the, well, even the Rock, I guess, at the beginning, too. But. Sure. <laughs> and, you know, you know, one of the things that, like, Grace says to me, uh, and, and I, I kind of laugh, and I say, yeah, I know, I've been there, done that. He'll say, you know, it's just so much fun out there, I didn't want to go home. <laughs> you know, it's, it's such a great, and, and, you know, I say, sure, I know exactly what, you know, there's times that I've tried to convey that to the kids who obviously haven't worked in front of 15,000 people, right? But you, it's not something you can put into words. But he senses it, he feels it, and when he's in it, that's where he, you know, it's almost like a cocoon, or, or it's, you know, he becomes a part of it. And I think that's, he is going to grow. I mean, he just can't wait to go do it again with somebody else of that caliber. He's not intimidated. And that's another thing, too. What I call, it's sort of called the Larry Bird syndrome. You know, we've got three seconds left, the game's tied, give me the damn ball. Instead of don't give me the ball, please get away from me. You know, yeah. and that, that's with race. I think that's one of the reasons he's going to make it is because, you know, he wants it so bad, you know, and he, you know, like to work with Jerry Lynn, oh, my God, or Malenko, oh, yes, please, then the Benoit thing. He's been, you know, he's been living at 24-7 since we finally made the match. You know, I think um, you've had a lot of guys come through your doors um, at, to to uh, train to be wrestlers, and when we talked to already about Ray Steele, the, probably the first or second time, um, you were on the show, and I mean, I think probably on conversations you and I had even before then, you had told me that he was going to make it, and he's, you know, pretty much done very, very well for himself. He's been on WFT TV a couple times in the last few weeks at the tapings, and um, and on some heat matches and stuff. What is it? You know, you knew from day, you knew, I, I'd say almost from day one. Okay, when when a guy comes through, if, if a guy who's listening wants to be a professional wrestler, wants to go to a wrestling school. Can you give us some advice on when you come in and you start, um, aside from that you've got to have certain mental toughness, obviously. I mean, obviously, I think that's number one. Actually. What do you need and what do you not need to do the most? What do you avoid? Uh, well, you, you, you need not to come with an ego or, or, not, or not think that you know. You know, so many people come in, look, I've watched wrestling for 10 years. You won't have to teach me a lot. Well, you know, my... My retort to that is, you know, I've been watching doctor shows since Ben Casey. I still can't do brain surgery for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> but that's, I mean, you know, a lot of guys think that they see, but they don't have, you know, the funny thing is I realized that when I was a kid watching that little black and white screen, that if I, if I was imitating what I saw there, I just didn't put a headlock on. I also, for whatever reason, uh, subconsciously, made me do it, but I was imitating the body language, like the way they would take the foot, you know, play, the foot placement and so forth. And, and I see the average guy doesn't, doesn't see that when they watch wrestling. They don't, they don't understand the mechanics. They watch it as an entertainment value, but they, a tool, but they don't watch it as an instructional tool. So they really don't know. I mean, that's a, a lot of the times I think that's the biggest. And, and they want to go straight to the big things. Okay, I want to do a Hurricane Rana. You know, or a shooting star press, you know, before they even know how to take a bump correctly. And or I, they want to start working on an angle. Yes. Or, or their character. You yeah, know, oh, oh, they, the they want to dress, they want to dress good, yeah. Worked out. Here's my gimmick. <laughs> you know? And, of course, obviously, we, you know, we all perceive ourselves a lot differently than everyone else. And I think that's a big mistake. You know, I think the character has to fit the person. And that's something you work on. I mean, my God, that 
that also has to do with your style and what you can and cannot do mechanically, I think. But I, I think the major thing to come is with a focus. We're ta- using race as an example here. Uh, you know, he came, he moved from New Mexico to Cincinnati, Ohio to do one thing, one thing only, to learn to be a professional wrestler. I have seen him get antsy when other guys weren't serious about their practice. Uh, he would come into the, into the building and go into the video room and watch tape and break it down. Uh, you know, he wants to talk, he'll call me sometimes to talk about, uh, how's this for a spot? If I did this and if I did that. He, he wants to get creative. And I think, I think you have, you know, you have to let the business consume you to the, uh, to that, to a certain degree. I mean, you obviously have to have a, another life, <laughs> at least a little bit of one. But, you know, you have to, you have to immerse yourself in it. And I think that's the only way to grasp it. That's, you know, everyone talks about how Helmsley is a student of the game. Well, so was Flair and so was Benoit, you know, or, or any of the greats, you know, they have let it consume them. And I, I think that that's, you know, basically what you have to do. You know, something you just mentioned was when you watched it as a kid, you actually watched, like, foot placement and everything like that. And I did the same thing as far as just I would watch, like, the actual moves, and I would do things in slow motion and see where everything was at. Right. And I see people now at, like, the school that come in, and sometimes I just I just want to ask them, do you ever actually watch any pro wrestling? Because <laughs> right. I, I just I see things, and it's like, if you have watched one pro wrestling match, you should know you know, this or that, and it's like they don't actually watch any wrestling. It's just the weirdest thing. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I'll tell you something, Brian. Uh, you know, one of the basic things to me is uh, you're a heel, I'm a baby face, and me to stalk you, the timing, and how mm-hmm. I, you know, threaten you, you back off and beg off as the heel, and they they, they don't understand that. Yeah. I mean, it's like they got to race right to you and hit you. <laughs> well, well, I mean, I mean, I mean, when you when you when you've watched a lot of the two and three minute matches where they're just boom, 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 that's that that becomes you know the, the the high the high spot or the broken table becomes the move as opposed to you know the story. You're right. Well, you're right, and I think a lot of especially younger children now uh, who have only seen Monday night, they think a match is four minutes. Yeah. They have that four minute mentality, and, and a, a lot a lot of fans watching it have that too. Yeah, yeah. when it, when it goes. When it goes too long, it's like they're they're ready for the next match. Yes. So it's it's, it's tough. I th- I think one of the things that a lot of people are talking about. Well, this raw was flat, or this. I think one of the things, uh, and I and no one take my word for it. No one WWF has come to me and asked me or told me this is what they're doing. But this is what I'm surmising. Uh, is they are re-educating the fans to a degree to a more solid, deliberate style, and I applaud that simply for the fact that these guys now won't have to worry about being in a wheelchair, at least until they're my age or older, you know. That, that, is, that is true. I have noticed in the last couple of months that there's more of a, 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 and also they've really de-emphasized the really outlandish moves. I mean, you really don't see, um, I mean, you were seeing a lot more crazy moves out of the WCW guys than right. you were out of the WWF guys. WWF, it's more solid, you know, more solid wrestling. Sometimes it's too quick, but, you know, sometimes. Last night they had a lot of, you know, they gave some, some guys time. Yeah, I, you know, and I, I think it's a good thing that they, re- you know, like I say, for the health and well-being of the performers, yeah. at least. I think a lot of that is Paul Heyman, too, as far as, you know, he came in and all of a sudden it's a big emphasis on trying to get some missions over, some mat wrestling over, and uh, it seems like something that he would have uh, suggested. Yeah, I, well, you know, I like, uh, I know a lot of people are saying bring back the king and this and that, and I, I, and I think the first couple shows that uh, Paul did with Jr. I thought he was... Maybe put too much pressure on Jr. with leaning on him too hard, you know, because uh, Jr. is definitely is the man when it comes to play by play. And I say in a situation like that, let him run with it and build your thing around it, which Paul does now. But the thing I like about Paul versus Jerry Lawler, and Jerry did a hell of a job. Don't get me wrong, but the thing I like now is Paul is more serious about, let's say, a Benoit angle match, which should be more serious. Yeah, you know, and, and this is a criticism that that, that there's not the, the fun thing, but when. Paul is is much better at getting over certain psychological mechan- mechanisms of the match, like you know explaining why they're tapping or what he's working on. Whereas Lawler was pretty much there just to entertain. Yes, and, and I think I think it makes uh, the viewer, the fan, more into the match the way Paul lays it out for you. It gives you something to hang your hat on, other than just there's two guys fighting up there. You know. Yeah. Let's start. Let's start with the callers. We're gonna start with Ed in Texas. Ed, what's going on? Yeah, guys, how you guys doing today? Hey. Uh, hey. What I wanted to talk about was a little bit about SmackDown last night. 
I thought it was a pretty good show. I thought all the matches were pretty decent, uh, except for the China one, of course. And uh, most of the segments backstage were pretty cool. Um, the very first interview was a little slow, but I thought overall it was a pretty good show. And I was kind of wondering what you guys thought about it. Yeah, we, we talked about it to start the show. Um, I didn't like the, the way the show ended. Um, but as far as the wrestling content of the show, I thought it was the best wrestling content of a WF television show in several weeks, and I was certainly glad to see that. Okay. Also, I had noticed something on the show, and I had talked to you a, uh, a while back, I think it was right after WrestleMania, about China, and that her possibly trying to sabotage Lita when it came time for her to pass the strap. And I kind of mm -hmm. think it started last night. I don't know if you noticed, but um, I, I noticed that Lita had her pants all the way up, and she didn't have any part of her thong showing. And okay, China that's, that's more a SmackDown thing, though. They always do that. That's a SmackDown thing. thing, and China was wearing a lot more clothes than she usually wears, too. I think it's just that they're a lot more conservative on SmackDown because that's the one that's monitored more closely. Oh, I thought it might have something to do with China's trunks, the way they had that strap, that it kind of looked like a thong. No, 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 no. Because I, 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 that's Lita's gimmick is, is that thing, so China wouldn't be taking her gimmick. It's just if, if they're dressing the women slightly more conservatively um, on a Thursday, it's because that's a company directive. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And then um, I do have a question for Les. Um, it's, a, it's, a, like, um, it's an email that I sent to Dave, but he hasn't answered it yet. And, uh, and it's, uh, what I would like to know is who, in your opinion, were the five best guys at getting heat? And when I say heat, I don't mean guys that went out and hit a girl over the head with a guitar. I mean just guys that it was just natural that they went out and everybody hated the guts. I like this guy. <laughs> he, likes, he likes real heat. Uh, Does X-Pac count? <laughs> He's got a real strange kind of heat. You know, uh, gosh, I, you know, there's, there's, there's so many good heels, I think. Uh, one just passed away, and the last time I was on Dave's show with Flair and Bastine and Larry Manisic, that, that would be one, obviously, Johnny Valentine. I think Buddy Rogers was a tremendous heel. Uh, the Sheik, the original Sheik, was a heat magnet. Uh -huh. He was very good at getting heat. Of course, and currently, I think Austin and Helmsley are getting what I would call good old-fashioned solid heat right now. I thought Shawn Michaels, when it came to the ability to get heat, was tremendous. One of the best I ever saw. Uh, I would I mean, have to it, agree. It, there was something he, there was something he had where you could really hate him when he was playing the heel. The um, the other one I was going to bring somebody else up. Well, the um, person in my mind that that I really um, thought was really probably the best, and I, I had the pleasure of watching like maybe his last year, and that's Art Bar. Phenomenal. I mean, oh, yeah. get so much hatred out of a crowd than him. I never had the Phenomenal. opportunity to see him work much, so I, I couldn't give you an opinion. I've heard, I've always heard that he was very good. Yeah. Um, there's someone I was asked less about, because I always saw him mostly as a baby face. He worked as a heel, I guess, you know, but this, by the time I, I saw him, he was 55 years old, and, and he was still drawing huge crowds. How was Blassie? Because I always got Blass, the impression oh, that Blassie was, would yeah, be in that caliber. Great at getting heat. Yeah. He, yeah, very good. Very good. Yeah, Freddie. Freddie had great timing. Yeah, because I mean, he he. You know, I look back at like the history of Los Angeles wrestling, and and Fred Blassie. I mean, there's a constant um, in Los Angeles from the '60s, at least the '60s through '75, and that is the periods when the business was when you look at sell out, sell out, sell out, sell out. It was almost invariably when Blassie was there, and then the periods when the business was horrible it was when Fred Blassie was working Georgia. Yeah, you know, that the, the crazy thing with Blassie was. With him filing his teeth, I mean, they got over with people for whatever reason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember those pictures from magazines. <laughs> yeah. Anything else, Ed? Yeah, there's uh, one more thing I did want to ask you about. Um, God, I kind of lost my chain of, uh, chain of thought. Uh, it is Friday. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's about uh, Tom Zink. Yeah. I've, I've, heard, oh. I heard, I've heard him on the law, and I thought he was really good, and I've seen your archives, and the first few of them, I thought he was really good, but I've noticed the last couple, he hasn't really made too much sense, and I know you've kind of been struggling with him. <laughs> Uh-oh, there may be a run-in yeah. today. <laughs> yeah, I know, really. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, we'll ask him about it. Yeah, Tell we'll ask him about it. He's going to be on next Tell week. Tell him that. Yeah. Oh, I will. I definitely he'll, will. He'll start cutting a promo. <laughs> yeah, he, he kind of, like the last time he called, what was a few days ago? Yeah, yeah it's Tuesday. I didn't anything he was talking about, really. And uh, it surprised me because I thought he was really good at first, but just the more he's on, it just the less sense he kind of makes. And I don't know. I just, uh, <laughs> he's really like he was. He was my favorite guest, but now he's kind of not. You know, I mean, slowly but surely, he's 
He's kind of call in, young. tell him that, and then tell him that he's bitter. Uh-huh. That'll make for no, a good Don't show. tell him that he's bitter. Don't oh, tell yeah, him I he's heard bitter. him go off that one time the guy called him some <laughs> he was bitter. Yeah. So, but anyway, uh, okay. thanks a lot, guys, for taking my call. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, we're going to go to West. West, what's going on? Hey, guys, how's it going? Going really good. Uh, first question for you, Les. Uh, you put on your bookie now, I guess. How do you think the... Uh, you know, WCW, WWS things will end up playing out. And the second part of it, I guess, would be what happened with the Smoky Mountain USWA. I thought that could have you know, done some business, and it kind of fell apart fast. Well, first of all, I think I think the WCW, WWS thing is going to add a new dimension to our industry simply because they'll be doing things uh, over the next few years that have never been possible before in terms of uh, interpromotional things, trade, you know, guys, you know, free agency. Uh, been stealing from Shane and, and vice versa. Uh, you know, a lot, a lot of those things. I, I think uh, what really set the tone for me was just, I think it was one week later after the simulcaster two when uh, Vince was browbeating JR and JR and says, well, I guess you don't be working for me. And JR said, well, if I'm not tomorrow, I'll be working for your son at WCW. And it was, I thought, my God, no wonder could ever say that before. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. it just hit me like that. And I thought, wow, this is, you know, so I think there's another dimension. So I, I, I think it's, I think it'll play out well, you know, and I think the sooner they get to it, obviously, um, you know, the better off it will be. But, I, but also, until there's a time slot, there's no sense to start, start to do tapes. So, you know, it, it's, uh, they've, they've obviously got to wait for that. I think, uh, it'll play out well. As far as USWA and Smokey, uh, with USWA, gosh, I, you know, I can't, Tell you what happened down there with Smokey. Uh, the best talent kept going to, to the to the highest bidder, and uh, you know at one point uh, those of us that worked in Smokey called WWF Smoky Mountain uh, East because so many of you know uh, and of course that's what the business is about you know making more money and working your way to the top. And uh, I think I think he means he means like for a little while there they were doing a feud. It started off pretty good. Oh, and right. just kind of stuff on TV, you know, back and forth. Oh, all right, yeah, I, I yeah, yeah. Was, the the feud just kind of didn't go anywhere. I mean, it was okay for a couple of weeks, but it didn't it didn't have legs. That's yeah, I think exactly. That's what exactly. And you know, they did not. I wasn't there, but they brought the uh, at, during fan week at Smokey. They uh, put them on a bus and took them up to Louisville uh, for a show at Louisville Gardens. And they identified the Smokey fans to the Louisville fans, the USWA fans, and the, and the Smokey fans had to have an escort to get out of the building. For God's sake, <laughs> they had that kind of heat. But it, it, yeah, I, I'd like Dave. I think it just never—it never had legs. They, they never had any long-term plans for it. Another question: How separate do you think they have to keep WCW? Because I was just thinking about you know when they when they finally get a day to start this show, are they going to promote it on Raw? They have to. You would never see like a Nitro commercial or anything like that on Raw. And, and if they're promoting another show, and we talked about this earlier, you know, if WCW has a great pay-per-view and a great match on there, are they going to show clips on Raw? I mean, how separate do they have to keep this thing, and is it going to work? Well, I think I think they're going to have to, you know, uh, play it by ear to start with, don't you? I mean, like I say, they're an uncharted ground, basically. Mm-hmm. They're, they're going where none of us have ever gone before. So they're, you know, it's going to be trial and error, and, and they're obviously going to make some mistakes, you know. But I, but I think. Long term, I see it being successful, and I think I think the fans will get into it. Yeah, I'm just wondering, like, like how separate would it really yeah. have to be for fans to buy that this is a separate organization run by Shane and not just like another TV show with different guys? Well, the thing, Brian, thinks is, is for whatever it was worth, nobody really ever bought the NWO as being separate, and that was a good angle. So, yeah. so, so they, they, you know, they just have to be able to suspend their disbelief as much as, because I don't think that anyone's actually deep down going to believe that, you know, Shane, you know what I mean, they're both owned by the McMahons and they're both owned by WWE, right. you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's ways that they could do it, because, I mean, you know, you had the NWO had to supposedly buy TV time or whatever. I mean, I think it's going to have to be something like Nobody that. Nobody believed that, though. To- well, I didn't believe it, but it was it was at least a little more realistic than, you know, the WWE production team putting together a video package on a WCW pay-per-view and airing it on Raw like it was any other segment. I think the yeah. suspending a disbelief thing, I, you know, that's like if we all went to a movie tonight uh, to see a particular Mommy. actor. And if, if he's playing the part or she's playing the part correctly, at some point they be, they're not the actor any longer, but they draw us in they become the character. And that's why I think a lot of it has to do. You know, we were talking, we had this conversation over at our camp last night. Uh, I was always taught and I always even try, and if it's old school, I, I won't apologize for it. I just think it's the best way for the kids to learn. 
But I, when I put together a show, when I put together an angle or storyline, I always parallel it with real life. And I'll, I'll tell you something that I have that I've never believed in in uh, almost 41 years in the business is, uh, say, uh, Brian, you and I just wrestled for the championship. I won the belt. You were uh, clobbering me with a chair or whatever, grab the belt and take off and say, okay, now if you want the belt back, you've got to wrestle me. And I say, no way. You know, my, my analogy of that is uh, you're the winning Super Bowl coach and I'm the loser. And just as uh, they're presenting you with a trophy in your locker room, I come in and nail you and grab the trophy. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be suspended or fired or, or out of the NFL before I get back across the field, for God's sakes. Yeah. So I see no realism. Or, or the fact that you and I are tag team partners and my plane was late, so Dave takes my place and you guys, that's like Mike Tyson, say, okay, hold the field. I've got. I stubbed my toe and I can't make it. How about creative <laughs> license of wrestling bookers? Yeah, we'll replace, I, we'll replace I, you I, with somebody I, else and they'll defend the title. Yeah, but I won't. I won't book that way because I think somewhere in your subconscious that rings untrue. I mean, yeah. you, don't, you don't sit down and think about the way I'm thinking about it or laying it out to you here. But I think it, it's just like it's like one of us trying to be a character that we're not, or it's like trying to make Steve Austin the ringmaster. He wasn't the ringmaster, so it, it wasn't going to work, or at least not nearly as effective as Stone Cold, because now it's more just Steve being Steve, uh, you know, exaggerated. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that's one of the things that makes, uh, makes, makes it work or doesn't, and I think that Vince plays his character so well, and I think Shane comes <laughs> off on the babyface side, you know, that they will be able to carry it off. Yeah. Vince is a really believable character for some reason. <laughs> he, he, lives lives it. It. <laughs> he lives it. He lives that thing 24 hours a day. You know, one of our, uh, Brock Guthman, one of our managers, who is very good, uh, has done some little theater, and he's always telling the guys, you know, identify it with some real life experience. You know, if you got it's like method acting, right? Exactly. exactly. That's, 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 for, that's, that's for his deal. I mean, you wrote about it in the book. Yeah, yeah, that's why his interviews are so incredible, because he believes, he, he makes himself believe every word of it. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Anything else, Wes? Yeah, I just want to ask the uh, last one question in regards to what, what do you think of the whole thing with Brian Pillman back in 96 when he started the loose cannon? I mean, even now, I know Dave, you said before, didn't make a dime of money, but it sure as hell got a lot of people in the business. Oh, it you know, made money for him. Yeah. Yeah. yeah what do you it think was, of uh, Pillman was an extraordinary talent. I mean, personality-wise. Everyone heard that gravelly voice, and they were put off by it. You know, a lot of people were intimidated by that voice. But Brian was a very, honestly, you know, and when I say this, you know, I, you know, we weren't that close. But, I mean, the Brian that I knew and the Brian I talked to, the Brian I got to know, was really a sensitive person with a tremendous uh, quick mind. Uh, Brian was very, very smart. Yes. Um, um, he, I mean, I, I said he's very smart, but he got way out of control at the end. Oh, sure. I agree. Well, you know, the days that you, you stop and say, as long as you've been around our business, some of the some of the most brilliant minds, business-wise, are way left to center. I yeah. mean, they're definitely walking to their own drummer. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I think that, what was that uh, saying? There's a fine line between genius and insanity. And yeah. there is. Absolutely. <laughs> there is. Um, let's go to Eric. Eric, what's up? Hey guys. Hey Eric. Hey. hey. William Regal was uh, phenomenal last night with his acting. Don't you think? You know, we come back on Triple H. That yeah. was very, that was tremendous. I was marking out for it. You talk about uh, facial expressions. Oh yeah, he's this awesome. This guy is great. Uh, Les. Yes. You organized the Brian Tillman Memorial Show, right? Correct. Would uh, wrestlers that are still under Time Warner contract be able to appear on the show? We we don't believe so. Uh, you know that's that's what you know. We we actually have not talked to anyone uh, in control at Time Warner. And uh, my, my feeling about that is that when I invite somebody to the show, I invite, you know, it's like that's not the meaning they have to show up. And I think if, if they, you know, these guys pretty much know they want to come, they don't want to come. I think Flair, uh, Rick enjoyed it. I think uh, Rick sensed, you know, the value of it. And if he's uncomfortable with it, then I wouldn't want him to pursue it. You know, I, uh, you know, but I. You know, I, I tend to believe what he said when uh, right here on Dave's show. Uh, I think they would go to any, you know, do whatever they could to avoid those contracts because I agree with him as much as I think. Well, what's, what, there's no, there's well, no upside to them for paying him. Huh? 
I'm sorry. There's no saying? upside for them for paying. So any loophole they can, to, it's, it's half a million dollars off the books. The guy, it's not like they're going to make money off these guys anymore. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, what exactly does it say? I mean, can they can they show up, or is it just you know strictly wrestling on the show, or what? Well, would it you know, from the way Rick uh, Rick's analogy was, he could go to your local hardware store and and sign autographs if he wanted to, but he couldn't do mm -hmm. that at your local indie show. So I'm assuming that we we would not even be able to acknowledge, you know, in other words, there's Dave Meltzer in the third row there. Hey, Dave, stand up and take a bow. Uh, we I don't have, know who that is next to him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sable, no, that's the, that was the other gimmick. <laughs> yeah, they tried that. They tried that one once. I remember that. Yeah. Then, oh, boy, boy, you talk about <laughs> you talk about people trying to do back talk talk about writing out a paper on the fax machine the next day. <laughs> oh my God! Like, uh, remember that story about she happened to buy a ticket? It's like, come yeah, on. yeah. She's it's just everyone's intelligence. Security check, guys check. from Time Warner. <laughs> yeah, with security guys there. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. She bought that seat right between those guys. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, uh, you know. A lot of people say, "Well, how can you have the Pillman without?" Uh, you know, but uh, I, I think we're gonna have a good show. I, I, I really do. Uh, it's gonna be different in as much as obviously it won't be ECW and WCW and WWF. But uh, I think the aura, whatever that aura happens to be that we've created with the show, is still gonna be there. I think the guys that show up are the ones that want to be there. Uh, that's like uh, a few weeks back. When I first saw uh, Raven in, in, in locker room, Les, you're doing the filming. Yes, got me in. Just like, you know, it wasn't, can I come? Hey, I want to be there. And uh, those guys come out and bust their humps. Uh, we've got Missy Hyatt and Electra. They're going to have a match. And Whoa. it's uh -oh. not good. Uh -oh. <laughs> it's, and they, you know, Missy, bless her heart, says, Les, it's, put us put us someplace where they'll, you'll, you can hide us. <laughs> But you know what? No she, false illusions. Yeah, she is showing up two years in a row, paid her own way there, uh, you know, done whatever we ask her to do. Uh, she and Electra called me just this couple of days ago uh, on a conference call, and I've never met Electra. But she's, she'd already met Les. I'll, uh, you know, the girls who are in the photo shoot and Playboy with me, I'll get them to know date something. We'll do it. We've, Missy and I have talked this over. We'll put something. I can put something on Playboy.com and auction it off there. And they really want to help. So... Am I going to make Dave watch him wrestle for a couple minutes? I am. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I'll live through it. <laughs> I think See, you can get him to go to the town with him afterwards, too. Listen, that's that right. He's not such a purist. He doesn't mind seeing uh, girls heavily endowed bouncing around. Hey, wait bit. a second. I will be getting Dave to go out on the town because I'll be with him. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about this last year when we were there. Don't worry. Yes, we did. Right. Uh, uh, Brian? Yeah. You're a big fan of AAA minis, right? Yeah. What do you think of Octagoncito? I think that he is out of this world. I saw him last Seriously, week. like one of the best wrestlers in the whole world. He was pretty awesome last week when I saw him. I saw him. Well, thanks That's for awesome. the time, guys. Okay, you're very welcome. You know, we get, ever since WCW went down, we get a lot more emails about AAA and EMLL. Hey, you know what? I'm telling everybody out there, if you have a dish and you do not get AAA and EMLL, you are a fool. You don't have to watch <laughs> everything, like the uh, the women... Or the uh, some of the hardcore stuff in AAA, but you just got to watch Oh, the hardcore stuff in AAA is so, so bad sometimes. Unless you want to see a guy do a dive and get lit on fire in midair and overshoot everybody and crash on the ground, then you might want to watch the AAA hardcore, but you just got to watch it. It's awesome. But the the I love, the EML is it's old school wrestling. It's, it's like it's not old school wrestling, but it is old school wrestling, if you know what mm -hmm. I mean. It's like totally different, but psychologically it's almost it's like a throwback to uh you know, just like long matches, two out of three falls, uh, heels that are heels. Veteran, I mean, the one thing about those those guys um, in Mexico that are on top, I mean, it's a negative and a positive. And the, the fact that they're all 45 years old and they've been wrestling for 25 years. 55. <laughs> yeah, some of them. They are very, well, Satanico. They, they have had more matches than any people alive, and they are very experienced in how to look, body language. There's certain things you can watch on them uh, on how to get reactions from the crowd. Um, yeah. And they still do, you know, they still do some decent acrobatics. I mean, the the style of what they do looks foreign unless you've watched a lot of Lucha because it's, it's it's totally different. You know, they the take bumps differently because they're on these rings made out of concrete practically, so they don't take flat back bumps <laughs> the same way. But, I think um, Satanico did a tope on this week's show. I haven't watched it yet, but he did. Yeah. yeah. You know, you guys so. are talking about timing. You just made me think of Flair and Dusty. 
at the last WCW pay per view. I mean, oh, they, they've had a good, they've done a good show. They've, they've I mean, people they're enjoyed, tiny, there's just right? something about them, you know. They didn't actually do anything really in the ring. No. But just the way that they were in there and what they did was just was made everyone tiny. else look like amateurs. It was when they did it and their body language and facial expression. Timing, yeah. boys, timing. It's what it's all about. You know who was really good at it, except, um, you know, they made him have to be just a co total comedy goof, but I used to, like, really get into him was uh, when, when Patterson came back, because pa Pat Patterson still threw, like, one of the best working punches. Yes. You know, when he when he was doing those matches when he was 57 years old, not the evening gown match, because that was an atrocity, <laughs> but, but some, some yeah, of those, like, some of the, didn't, you, didn't they do a match with the Mean Street Posse that was, like, unbelievably entertaining, Patterson versus oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. One, yeah. one of them. And yeah. you're right, he does. He still throws one of the best punches in the business. You're absolutely yep. right. I'm going to hit a couple of emails before uh, we get to the break. Um, let's see. This is from Simon Allen in Australia. Is there a date set for the Ray Stevens special? I don't believe so. Uh, am I wrong, Al, on that one? What's that? I'm sorry. What's Ray that? Stevens special. No date. Uh, no, no date yet. Still uh, confirming okay. a couple of guys. Okay. After seeing Brock Lesnar, I have to wonder about drug testing in college sports. Uh, Brock is not in college sports anymore, by the way. <laughs> He's in professional sports. <laughs> Although he was huge when he was in college, too. Um, and I have to wonder if you think Ben Johnson was right when he said that you have to be on drugs to win a gold, as this is one area where it is not only wrestling that has a serious drug problem. By the way, I like Brock. Hey, you know, uh, you can't put the genie back ben in Johnson the bottle. Johnson was like 1988, wasn't he? Yeah, so if anything, things are, are a lot worse than they are now. Yeah. And, and a lot more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A lot more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know... You know what's funny is, is, is we, you know, everyone, the, the buzzword is steroids. And Les, you know, I, I mean, I don't know how close he is to the scene, but, you know, Les actually is, And another thing we never talk about, Les is a former competitive bodybuilder, bodybuilding trainer, bodybuilding supplements, uh, very knowledgeable on bodybuilding supplements. But the, um, you know, the, the steroids are just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to physique drugs nowadays. And, and, and in the future, they'll probably be even more of a piece. When they're doing this gene therapy stuff, have you read about the gene therapy stuff, Les? I've read a little bit about it, not not a whole lot, but it's very fascinating. And yeah, yeah, and it, you're right. It's, I mean, this thing is so sophisticated. It, it's you know, and it's like when somebody says, "Well, I don't take steroids," and they may not. They may be telling the truth. <laughs> exactly. But Fifteen they, other different drugs. Exactly. You know, so, yeah, because yeah, I cause I remember like talking to to one wrestler who who tech, I mean, and I remember this because because they weren't lying to me and they were telling me like you know. I don't take steroids, but I do this, 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 and this. And they were mentioning, like, you know, all of these drugs that are not, and none of them are technically steroids, and um, and all of them are, you know, you know, ins insulin and everything else. And it's like, you know, actually, you'd be better off if you just took steroids, maybe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, it's scary you the stuff sound life like. quite as much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, that's the thing. When you see the freakier physiques, you know they come from someplace. And, and but you know, that's the other thing too. The sad thing is, so many kids think. They go out and, and buy a cycle of drugs that that's the end all be all and that's all that they need. But you yeah. you know you've got to train your butt off. You know you've got to eat right. And then once you come off of those things, you, you've got to bust your hump. You know to, to maintain whatever it was you got. So I mean. I mean the most frustrating thing is when I see guys that are on the juice and they don't even go to the gym and it's like why even bother? Oh yeah. If you just worked out oh, and didn't take steroids, you'd probably be in better shape right now. Exactly. Exactly. Well, or, 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 or you know what else is, is guys who, um, it, it, it's like guys who start going to the gym on their first day and have already bought their steroids, and it's like, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I don't think that anyone should even touch, I don't think anyone should touch it, and they don't need to if they're really smart about everything, but the thing is, you know, in the first couple of years, to. I mean, you've got to learn, you've got to learn how to train properly, because sure. the steroids will, 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 um, you know, your, 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 your response will not teach you to train properly. You'll, no. you'll, you'll, be, you'll be able to get away with a lot of mistakes, and it's better to learn your body because, you know, for, for your whole life. Sure. If you've been around, you see the telltale signs. I, I know it just, it's just it been within the last year. I saw a kid, uh, and I said, uh, what are you doing? Uh, what do you mean? He says, what do I said, what are you doing? I said, you're, doing, you're on something. Well, why do you say? I said, well, you're real puffy. You're holding water. You think so? No, I don't think so. I know so. You know, you're, well, yeah, well, I, and I'm, yeah, I got this this thing, and I said, well, you're just waterlogged. You know, it's, well, you know, I'm really not eating very. I said, well, then why are you bothering? Yeah. You know, 
Uh, That's but, the other one, the guys that eat, that eat, that eat like pizza like crazy and then take steroids. And, yeah. Because you know, they always end up being like really bloated. Yeah. You know, and I said, well, you know, the Except sad for, thing is you wasted your money, you wasted your time, and, and when and when you come off of that, you're going to shrink back. You think so? I said, yes, I do. And sure enough, that's, you know, I saw the kid, oh, I don't know, maybe a month or so later, and, and it was already noticeable. He wasn't as waterlogged, but he had no size to him either. You know? I remember this one guy was all puffy from the water and everything like that. He was on the juice, and I chopped him, and, like, the first layer of skin just came right off. <laughs> it was so nasty. I have never seen I'm trying to envision that. My Jennifer Lopez analogy is better than that, Ron. Yes, it is. <laughs> it is. Got a couple of emails here um, for for Les. This is from Garen Shea, who wants to know what your thoughts were of Whitey Caldwell. Whitey Caldwell is my ex tag team partner. He uh, was a good worker. Uh, probably pound for pound. One of the, one of the uh, toughest guys I've ever was around. He was uh, never made his mark anywhere but in East Tennessee. Born and raised up around the Tri Cities, Kingsport, uh, Johnson City, uh, Bristol, in that area. And uh, I first met him in 1968, the first time I was ever in Knoxville, out of the Nashville office. John Kazana was the promoter. And uh, John says, I, I need a baby face here to team up with this local guy. And back then, you you know, you didn't want to be teamed up with a local guy because that was kind of your kiss of death, you know, because you knew the local guys weren't that good. But I saw him work for the first time that night. I'm like, wow, this guy is really good, you know. But anyway, long story short, uh, Kazana got, he didn't have TV at that time when he finally got TV in Knoxville. Whitey and I were the first uh, babyface team to get hot off the TV. Uh, and the heel team was the Wright brothers, Ron and Don. And uh, anyway, we, we drew a lot of money and they had a lot of good times. Whitey was a uh, very, very good worker and a pretty tough little son of a gun, too. On top of it, not very big, uh, about 100 and, oh, 185, 190 pounds, real wiry. Uh, but a very good worker, uh, and so good, in fact, that he went in there against Dory Jr. and went 60 minutes, and the people believed it. You know, uh, in part, obviously, to Dory's talent as well. But uh, Whitey died in a car wreck on his way home from the matches one night, and uh, I think people still put uh, flowers on the grave up there. That was back in 72, I believe. Hmm. And this is from Garen. It's, it's, it's been said that he wouldn't allow his picture to be taken so as not to take advantage of the fans, which certainly was unique for any wrestler of any era. Is that true? I don't, I don't, I don't know that story. Uh, yeah, he, uh, yeah, he, he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't let anybody sell his pictures. I mean, oh, okay. he, now, he would pose, you know, with your, your daughter or pose with you uh, for your snap, grab shots or anything. But, in other words, he wouldn't let Kazan or any of the promoters sell Whitey Caldwell pictures. Really? Because he, yeah, because mm-hmm. he thought that was taking advantage of the fans. Wow. Wow, that's certainly different. This is a question from Thomas who goes, when Fred Glass, he was on the Dick Van Dyke show, talking about, this is even further back than Whitey Caldwell. This is <laughs> the 60s. As a wrestling champion, what promotions belt was he wearing? I would presume that that was the old WWA World Heavyweight title belt out of Los Angeles that Glassy held in the 60s many, yeah, many times. Yeah, I think so, too. I, I remember seeing him on the Van Dyke show, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't remember the belt exactly. But yeah, it was yeah I, I'm, 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 I'm almost certain of that, actually. Probably wherever he was, whatever territory he was working at the time. Which yeah, was Los Angeles LA, territory. Right? Yeah. Uh, was there ever a plan to give Rick Rude or Kurt Hennig the WWF title? I never, ever heard of that, of, of either of those guys being considered. Because um, that's the Hogan era, and, you know, it's other guys, you know, those guys were just weren't considered for the belt. They were too small. They did not work <laughs> a heavyweight style. <laughs> yeah. No, it's just whatever. Uh, let's go to Terry in North Carolina. Terry, what's going on? I'm doing fine. It's true that um, McMahon is uh, renaming Full Load to Invasion because if it's true or whatever, um, It'll be great for the WCW stars to get some airtime. I mean, man could push these guys to be um, stars until WCW can get relaunched. Yeah, I'm kind of curious as to exactly. Stars. Yeah, I'm kind of curious as to how this is all going to go down. But um, the last I heard, which was as of what day was this? Saturday or Sunday? Sunday night. Uh, they they were still um, they had changed the name of the show to Invasion, and I'm going to try to check. Actually, the minute the show's over, believe it or not, I got couple of things that I have to check on, so and that'll be one of them. But um, um, you know, the plan as of a week ago was that there would be WCW guys, and that, that the Invasion show would be built around Vince and Shane, uh, and that. So I, I don't know if it's interpromotional matches or just a run-in or just like this threat that we're showing up at this show, Vince. You don't, and then people will find out who shows up and who doesn't. I don't know what the storyline, how they're going to do it, but yeah, they're going to do that on the show after uh, King of the Ring. Okay. Um, yes, another thing too. You think it's a bad idea for the Rock on um, to become a um, heel right here? 
Like uh, uh, horrible idea. <laughs> what I'm thinking of with Let's this just right turn here. everybody heel. <laughs> horrible idea. What I'm thinking of with this right here. I think it'll kill him. Basically, he blamed the fans and McMahon for not letting him be black. Uh, terrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> Will not happen. No. I doubt that'll happen right there. No, that one's not happening. Um, and he's, you know, I mean, he's. They got to go with the babyface thing with him for for a while, don't you Ever. think, uh, maybe forever. Well, nothing's forever. He's gonna be a movie star, though. He's yeah, gonna be one of those it. guys like Flair, where he's just so big and such an icon that how do you turn this guy heel? <laughs> they, tr they tried with Austin, and look what's happening. Yep. Yeah, I know. Let's go to Rob in New York. Rob, what's going on? Hey, Rob. Rob. Hello, Rob. Hi. I I'd like to know what you think about the China Lita angle. And it's it's horrible. If you think will be turning heel in the near future. What, China? Yeah, or Lita. No, China. Yeah, I think China will probably turn this Sunday. Yeah? Yeah, at the end of the match. Yeah, then, I think uh, the end of the match. Also, another thing. I'd like to say WrestlePost.com poem that was issued on Wrestling Observer today. I'd like to say it was a very entertaining article, but I think it should have been a bit longer. Which, what, what are you talking His about? His article on the wrestling landscape? Right. As long as I was going to go go on a Wednesday morning. <laughs> <laughs> I woke up at like ten o'clock to write until three a.m. on Tuesday night. That was about as far as I could go. I can't believe how long that thing was, especially at that time. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks. Okay. Very welcome. Thanks let's for the plug for the uh, website there, by the way. Yeah. Let's go to Zach in Texas. Zach, what's up? Uh, evening, gentlemen. Hello. Uh, I think if you ever do a frequently asked questions page, the first one should be how you doing. The second one is, the second I'm one doing is, just fine. The, <laughs> the second one is, what really happened to Shawn Michaels? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, anyway, we get that I one three have, times a the day. The third is, that's a work, right? Anyway, <laughs> I was just going to say, after the recent series of women's so-called matches on WWF TV, it just has really struck me that, of course, it'll never happen. But what they really need to do is take every one of those women off TV who they ever plan to have work another match except maybe Stephanie since she can't I guess can't be removed for six months or so but I would in San Mexico Mexico no. <laughs> I was thinking more Japan or hell just anyone who, who they'll die in Japan those, those women except for Jackie and, 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 and uh, Terry, Terry Power you know Tori they'll die in Japan really but I, I was yes. just thinking they need to be taken off for about six months and just retaught how to wrestle. Brought up to something that could, in some joking manner, be called professional work. Because it's unwatchable. It's also same problem that WCW had. Except they're they're a little bit better than the, they're a little better trained than the WCW women. But you know there was this mentality that. You know, you know, it's, that, that women drive ratings, and in small doses, you know, Sable did, and 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 you know, China and Lita are not getting killed in the ratings, but when you overdo it, boy. Well, know, the thing is, when this feud is over, this division is dead because to build up China, she's squashed everyone. Yeah. And the thing is, in the '80s, you could squash people because there were a bunch of other people on the roster that you weren't squashing. But when you have five women and you squash all of them except one, what happens when the feud with that one is over? Right. Well, but They'll bring Jackie back. You know, you know, in terms of, of uh, talent, I, I I think the current fan, just if you've just become a fan the last couple of years, uh, doesn't expect a lot. You know, I mean, they're you know, those of us who've been around a while obviously expect much more. But you know, I, I think the current fan, this is what they see, so that's what they expect. I mean, not that it's good, bad, or indifferent. I think they just, oh, okay, here's another girls match. The more I think about it, the more I think that American promoters. Are afraid to to uh, to portray the women as competent workers. I think that they feel safer with the cat fight spots and and a woman whose gimmick basically is what kind of underwear she wears than with a strong female who is portrayed as a competent worker. I mean, China squashes everyone, but it's not because she is a good wrestler. It's because she's a freak. I can see maybe if they brought in a bunch of Japanese women that were better than the men, there might be a problem. 
But mm-hmm. even if you had women that were just, you know, equivalent to the lower card guys, I don't see why that would be a problem, but they're not even at that level. Yeah. It just, it's something that's been simmering in my mind ever since Lawler came on and said he didn't want to see women wrestle because it wasn't sexy. Which, I don't see anything wrong with women being athletically, you know, uh, having athletic ability. I, you know, I yeah. feel like, it's like female bodybuilders. Uh, yeah. you know, there, 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 there is though, I mean, I, I think there is a mentality in, in parts of wrestling, I don't know if it's, you know, that, that, that that like a well worked women's match doesn't serve a purpose, but you know guys want to see the women you know with the implants and the clothes ripping. Right. Well, you know I don't know why you can't have a nice body and be able to work too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, well, there is no law against that. Two gum at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Two more things. I'll be real quick and let y'all go. First of all, I would like to formally apologize for predicting a Dudley Holly family feud last winter, since it's happening now. <laughs> and second of all, just a quick plug, uh, the Houston Museum of Fine Arts is running Gaia Girls next weekend. Really? Next, yes. Cool. Next, I sent you an email about that, but it never made it onto the show. Next Saturday night and then on Memorial Day in the evening, they are running running the film. So I thought wow. that for anyone in South Texas, I would get that out. And lastly... Let, let me know how the thing is, because cause I, I still have not seen that movie, and, and, you know, most people who've seen that movie rave about it. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to go. I want to so badly, but I can't. Okay. If, anyone, can't. if anyone's in, in that part of Texas, Houston area, um, and you're going, call us up. Or, or you know what? If anyone, or if anyone uh, in the area has already seen it, the, uh, San Francisco. Or anyone, anyone like in Boston or San Francisco where it's, where it's played. Chicago, I know it's played as well. And Toronto as well, too. Um if, if anyone's seen it, because, you know, I, I'm just very curious about that movie, because, again, like I said, you know, I, I know people who say it's better than Beyond the Mat, so. Hopefully it'll make it to DVD here. But, uh, I, I, now I, I really. At some point should. Yeah, I really will let you go, but just from the, the natural heel heat conversation from earlier, I would like to add, I mean, I, I only saw about the last five years of his career, obviously, but 94 till 99, every time he went into. Any building I was in, Owen Hart just got booed out of the building. Even if he was, he just kind of exuded this kind of sm- whiny sm- bitch thing, but he still backed it up. He he did real well in the in the Brett feud, but I, I wouldn't put I wouldn't put Owen Hart, um, you know, as far as like you know main event that kind of heat. Yeah. In, in the caliber of, 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 of what I hear, and again, I never really saw, of, 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 well, actually, I did see tapes of, but like a, of, a, of a Buddy Rogers or, right. you know, someone like like that or, um, you know, the Sheik, who I did see. You know, I mean, some of those guys, boy, that was a, that's Sheik heat. That was a different kind of heat. <laughs> <laughs> I will let you gentlemen go. Have a good weekend. And okay. good luck with your with your guys, Les. Thank Hope you very to much. Hope see them on TV soon because we need them. All right. Thanks. Okay, thanks a bunch, Zach. I'm going to go uh, a couple of emails, and then we'll head to a break. Uh, this is is uh, Frank Trigg going to fight for Pride? Uh, he's not. He's not on this next show, um, and uh, he was considered, but he's not on this next show. I don't know when he's fighting again. Is Tajiri going to be Chris Jericho's partner? It's an interesting name. Um, I don't know who the partner is going to be, but uh, interesting what team. Pr- what? Yeah, interesting yeah, team. Yeah. Hey, it'd be good. I think people would be happy with that as a surprise too. Yeah. You know, which you know, there's a big. Uh, we got a big like uh. Where are they in the pay per view? What though? You know, in the in the tag team match. I know, but where where's the pay per view being held? Uh, Sacramento, which would not, oh. it, it, as far as geographically, that would not be like a perfect city for Tajiri because ECW never came here and never had TV here other than TNN. Because what are the chances of Rob Van Dam showing up at Judgment Day? I would think he'd be a perfect injection in the WF lineup to liven things up. Um. You know, I mean, they're they're very close to a contract. I don't anticipate him being ready by Sunday. But I mean, if they want him, I mean, if they want him, it'll be, he'll be there. You know, I mean, he really needs to be a WCW guy, though. They need a name like that there. Uh, I agree, and I I think that that's what. Uh, let's see, because I had chances from Joey in Toronto. Because I had, had chance to hear Carl DeMarco do a local radio interview. Could you please clear up a couple things he said last night? Uh-oh. He said ratings in Canada have doubled since 1999, as have the number of advertisers in Canada. I don't know about the advertising in Canada. Uh, ratings doubled since '99. I I would doubt that. Um, I mean, if you said doubled since 1996, I'm sure they have because they have here. 
99, I, I don't know. Maybe but again, in I don't, 1899. Then they have. He also said that 3 million Canadians watch Raw on TSN, which would be 10% of the country. I can't imagine that being anywhere close to the truth. It's not. That's why. <laughs> there's, only, there's only about 5 million that watch, uh, or no, 6 million that watch Raw in the United States, so there aren't 3 million watching in Canada. I, I think the number is closer to 750,000. It's the last I had heard. Uh, let's see. Uh, now the tough enough is over. Any ideas when and how Tory may be reintroduced? Don't know. Uh, Lance Storm is Jericho's tag partner. I mean, they could do it, but I would really be shocked. I think that they mm. could keep him in the WCW side for sure. Um, yeah, what are the chances of Jericho's partner being a WCW guy to jumpstart the invasion angle? Again, if that's the idea they want to go with, but I, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't heard of any of those guys. Um, but again, all it takes is one phone call if that's what they want to do. Yeah. They want to get to a couple of uh, emails, and then we'll get back to the calls. Uh, someone else who wants Lance Storm to be Jericho's partner. Uh, I don't. I would bet against it. I mean, it is a possibility, but I would bet against it. And it says not only are they a great team, but I think W fans will buy them beating Triple H in Austin. Um, glad that'd be unique. So. That'd be unique. I don't see it happening, but something's got to happen. So maybe, maybe. I mean, I mean, people don't think that uh, that a lot of this doesn't have influence on people in the WWF. Now, it may influence them negatively, it may influence them positively, but, <laughs> but they, they they know the sentiment. Um, and there's people, hey, there's people in the company and there's people on the writing staff. They all know the sentiment. The idea of, um, believe me, the idea of Benoit and Jericho uh, beating Helmsley and Austin on, on Raw for the tag team titles has been presented as an idea. And I'm not sure, I, 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 I don't know. I've even heard that Austin and, and Helmsley may be willing to do it. So who knows? Uh, Jim Ross's report line of the week says, quote, Our business cannot exist without new and talented young stars being introduced on our TV shows in a variety of unique ways. See? They see? It's another person says it. It's, it's, it's the future. It's, it, hey, ser seriously, the way, the way TV runs through people, you know, I mean, like we talked about two years ago, it seems like a million years ago in this business. Two and months you got ago. A constant... Yeah, you got to constantly be creating new stars. The one good thing is, is that, um, you know, I mean, they're doing stuff. Uh, this is, it just seems so weird to think of that simulcast. It, it almost seems like ancient history. It doesn't seem like so a long time ago, does it? Seven weeks ago. Unbelievable. Hey, think about this. The opening of the XFL season was only a couple months ago. <laughs> February 3rd, 9.5 rating. Think of that. Um, how quickly things change. This is, uh, I've been watching the Wrestling Gold DVD uh, the past couple of nights, which is the thing that Cornette and I did. And who's um, the guy doing commentary with Cornette? What? I'm the guy doing commentary with Cornette, yes. There's an eight-man tag team match that has Rick Rude wearing a dress, leading a team against what appear to be four enhancement workers, one of which is Tiger Mask. However, it wasn't who I was expecting. From listening to your and Cornette's comments, I learned that the guy was Ken Wayne. What was the deal with this? I believe the match took place in Memphis. It's true. Yeah, I've been through Memphis before. No. How did Ken Wayne get the gimmick, and how long did he use it for? What happened was um, Satoru Sayama was, was real, real big as Tiger Mask in Japan. Um, it was actually a phenomenon in, at that point in time. And I, I think he, he worked in Madison Square Garden a couple of times, and, you know, one match with Dynamite Kid. And, as, and, and it was, by the standards of the time, it was a pretty much a phenomenon. You know, something that, you know, his style was so quick. And so acrobatic it was something no one had ever seen before. It was an awesome worker. And so uh, Ken Wayne went to Kansas City, actually, I think. I think I had the promotion right. And Bob Geigel gave him the Tiger Mask mask, and they pretended he was the original Tiger Mask, and he did topes and things like that, which nobody had ever seen before, but Ken Wayne was not Satoru Sayama. Then he went to Memphis, and they didn't even bother pretending he was Satoru Sayama or the original one. He was just, he was just Tiger Mask. And he wore mask, that same mask as the Stray Cat in, in, um, in Georgia, too. There's one here for uh, just pushing for less. Okay, I'm going to get this one out here. Um, how many hours of TV did Crockett do in the late 60s and early 70s before eliminating everything but the Wednesday Raleigh tapings? He goes, I personally saw shows from Charlotte and Raleigh, but I know that there were also shows from High Point and Columbia and many other markets. It sounds like an insane schedule with so much TV and so many house shows. How, how tough was the schedule? I know you were in and out of that territory. Yeah, it, uh, well, there was, uh, Raleigh TV was always on Wednesday night. Charlotte was always on Wednesday night as, as well. Uh, Channel 3 in Charlotte uh, was done Wednesday night, so he had two TVs on Wednesday night. Tuesday night was High Point Television. Uh, I never remember anything in Columbia. Roanoke had its own TV, which was Saturday. Um, 
I think it was, that was I think it was pretty much it. So um, you were doing four television shows a week? Yeah, yeah, Unbelievable. absolutely, yeah. And then of course the, uh, those uh, well, uh, Charlotte wasn't bicycled. Raleigh was bicycled. Well, actually, in, in Raleigh, uh, they set up two desks and used two sets of commentators and uh, to double tape one match, and then it went into two different markets that way. With two, two different sets of commentators. Oh, so 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 so. Oh, I see. Because because they didn't have the technology to where they could voice over the tape. Right. So like you. So one set of commentators would be talking about matches in their city, and the other set would be talking about matches in their city. Absolutely. And you'd be doing. Wow. Two, and when you go to the interview breaks, then maybe I'd go to this desk, and you'd go to the other desk. You know. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then cross back over whatever. But yeah, we were doing it that way. We were uh, Kevin Kelly and I were talking about that the other day. We used to do. Uh, on Wednesdays in Raleigh, we'd start at noon, and uh, each show had two two-minute and twenty-second holes in it for uh, commercial interviews. And uh, we were in like thirty, thirty-eight or forty markets, and so we were doing, you know, obviously around wow, eighty. That's a lot of markets. Yes, eighty, uh, eighty-two to twenty spots. Plus, if we were sending the talent to somebody else's territory, we might be doing spots for that. Plus some thirties, and uh, I might do a hundred spots a day. Plus, do a show that night. Wow. <laughs> wow. This is, uh, no wonder guys got to, to be good on promos, huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll tell you what, and this is true. We used to use the old uh, photographer's back timer. They'd set it at 220. It was on a little rolling stand right under the camera lens, right next to my prompter. Uh, we, I used to write my own notes. We didn't have a teleprompter. But anyway, I, there's been times that, that that clock would malfunction. I've done so many of those spots that I could pick the timing time up in my head and get out of that spot without blowing it within a, a second or two once, you know, at the right spot. I mean, we just wow. had done so many of them, you know, that I almost, mm -hmm. it was like singing a song and, and having, the, you know, having the rhythm and the tune. So I was even amazed about it. <laughs> wow. That's, that's, that's really amazing. This is from Josh up for The up production church. people today complain. <laughs> yeah, because a couple of comments on Ohio Valley. I watched a lot of their shows since I live in Kentucky, and I think Jim Cornette's doing a superb job. They have a huge WWF OVW show coming up in late June. I think that that Angle Big Show, the Hardys, and some other WWF talent is going to be at it. I think the Dudleys. I don't know about the Hardys. The Dudleys. I think uh, Jericho might be there. Uh, I think yeah, Kurt I think he's there. Big Show is there. Uh, Kurt Angle I think or Undertaker. Yes, right? Undertaker is there. Yes, because yeah. I know they were cutting spots uh, last Tuesday for that. Yeah. yeah. The Louisville radio stations are hyping it as the last show ever at the Gardens. In fact, it is. They're going to close the Gardens up right after the show. Right. I was wondering if you could get Cornette on soon to talk about it. There's actually a pretty darn good chance uh, we may, if he's not if he's not free. We're, we're, we try to get him on before the big shows all the time. I think Brock Lesnar and Rico Constantino have great upsides, although Lesnar still sees, needs to work on basic things, including his punches that look weak. Out of all the talents, OVW, I think Randy Orton's got the brightest future, but he needs time. What's your thoughts? You know, you've seen a lot of those guys now. What's yeah, your thoughts Orton, on the guys? Yeah, Randy's come along really fast. Brock's good. They've got. I tell you, the guys that don't get much uh, press for whatever reason because they don't have the, the well, they're not third generation or don't have the big uh, amateur credentials. For Nick Densmore and Rob Conway and Flash, yeah. all three of them. Yeah. yeah, they're good. Yeah, and uh, Doug Basham, who is uh, Danny's nephew, uh, doesn't get a lot of pub at all. Doug's a damn good worker too. So Let's I mean, go to sh oh, okay, go ahead. Uh, there's several of those guys down there that, that I think. You know, everybody's talking about Brock Lesnar today. He's, you know, no, not today. Yeah, he's, that's what I tell people too. Yeah. Yeah, he's you know, they they see the, the the shooting star press and they don't see anything else. You know, and yeah. I mean, but he wants to learn, and he's a sponge, and he's, you know, and he absorbs everything you talk to him about, and he's getting better every outing, but yeah, he's not ready now. I don't want to, I don't want to lead it in any way, but it's pretty much the same thing where people saw the Hurricane Rana, and it was like, wow, look at this, this chick can work. Yeah. And then you see a match, and all of a sudden it's like, no, she can't. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. yeah, actually, actually, there's, there is a similarity there, because everyone, they see that big guy, and they watch that finish. And it's just like, oh my God! And then, you know, in your mind, you know the guy's a tough guy, is a national champion, amateur, and all that. But you know, he he he's very, you know, I mean, he's just green. He's green. You know, green. The, the psychology of this business does not come easy, and, and that's the point. It's not learning the holes, but it's it's you know, the, uh, the you can teach an idiot to do a moon salt. What you can teach him is how he why he did it and where he's going from the moon salt. That's yeah. true. You know, that's and that's, that's the thing. You, that's what, you know, it takes the time. It's the psychology. 
and that doesn't come overnight. You can't force feed that to them. They've got, they've got it. That's something you find on your own. You know, you find the groove, and, you, and that's when you're ready. Let's go to Sean and Pennsylvania. You can teach an idiot to do a moonsault because you really can. <laughs> you're just flipping over. Is it really that hard? In fact, I know a lot of idiots, Brian, that do moonsaults. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Dave, Especially the light bulbs. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And Sean, Dave, what's going on? Dave, I had two quick things. Um, one, uh, I called in like, uh, it seems like a year ago, but it was like probably six or seven months ago, uh, you know, and, and expressed my concern about the way they were treating the rock as far as jobbing them out, like week in, week out. And I think towards the end of this, towards when they were doing this Austin Hill turn, the Boos were kicking in. I think, uh, and at the time, I think he said, you know, well, you know, business is still good, so, you know, who are we to judge? Well, I think it kind of showed that, you know, I mean, if, I think the turn might have worked better if Rock was stronger when Austin made the turn, but he wasn't. Rock was actually the guy on the decline, and Austin was kind of resurging. Uh, yeah, you're, you're right about that. I think that nobody. I don't think that people expected the reaction to Rock to be what it is because then they were started confiscating signs and things like that, you know, because they were so paranoid about it. Um, I think they thought that Rock was the young guy on the way up, and you know, usually there's people kind of want to see something new, so the old veteran usually can can go heel in that situation, and and it didn't work, I think, the way everyone expected. But I don't think that that's Rock doing jobs. I think that there was something about it was the way um, he was portrayed. He was portrayed as a dick. Yeah, I, I, the whole thing with, with Rock was, I think that Rock was super, super cool, but I think that the people felt Austin was more one of them and Rock was more elite. And, I mean, he was cool elite. He was super cool, but it was like he's Hollywood and Austin is, uh, you know. The redneck. Like, the redneck, and I think the, the I don't I don't know. Les, what's your thought as far as that whole psychology of the last month leading up to WrestleMania as far as, like, you know, people all of a sudden that loved the Rock all of a sudden kind of mixed reaction on him? Yeah, you know, well, you know, they kind of go where you take them. You know, there's a, even a stampede as a leader. And I think, you know, in that, in that case, uh, they, you know, I, I think, of course, Texas trying, trying to turn Steve there, uh, logistically was, you know, was not, was not a sharp call. Yeah. Uh, I, I think they would tell you that. You know, that was tough. I, I think what they did with JR was, I, I think the fans, uh, were mixed simply because they went to their own, uh, basic instincts. You know, and maybe maybe what they're telling you too is Rock is just on the cusp, like we were talking about the difference between genius and idiot, right? Uh, and maybe mm -hmm. he's that easy. You know, Buddy Rogers, and this I've never seen this happen, but I've been told by the old timers, Rogers in a three fall match could work babyface the first fall, heal the second, and go back to babyface the third. He was that's that good. impressive. You know who could do that was Art Bar. Well, see, so, I mean, you know, and maybe Rock, and, and here again, you know, we're talking about a guy, uh, a phenomena, no doubt, but he's still learning. He is five years away from hitting his peak. If he's willing to continue to learn as good as he may be today, when he learns how to control that lightning bolt or put it in the bottle, then we can sell it better. And that, and He's, you know, he's going to have so many things going on in his life. Oh, sure. No. Sure. Yeah. One other thing, Dave. I know you're running out of time. I have a thing. Mark Henry, all right. I know he he's not one of your favorite workers, <laughs> but uh, uh, I have a thing. He, he about about a year and a half ago, when he was doing the sexual chocolate gimmick and he was still wrestling with D'Lo, I felt he was really over. I know he's not a great wrestler, but we've seen big men and big men little men teams before. But the big man's not a good wrestler, but he's with a little guy who is a good wrestler. You come in, do the big man spots, and still preserve whatever it is he got. I think Mark Henry was over, and Devo was over because he was with Mark Henry. I think they were really over before they did all the hand and the, you know, all May Young. It got a little, it got a little silly though. Can I interject something here? No, before all, mm -hmm. I mean before all that stuff. You know, uh, I get to spend a little time around Mark because of our association with OVW, and I'll tell you what, uh, Mark has a tremendous attitude. He works great with those guys. Everything's positive. Uh, never mind the weight loss, which he has done in spades. Uh, but the fact that he's got such a good attitude, I, you know, uh, I think he's got a great personality. Uh, and again, he's never going to be, uh, Chris Benoit, you know, but that doesn't mean in, in, in the way the business is today, he certainly, you know, he could be a part of it. And I think just on his attitude and his work ethic of the last, 
uh, however many months he's been down there, I think he deserves a shot. Okay, we are totally out of time right now. Um, and I want to thank Les for uh, being here tonight. David, real quick, filming tickets yes. go on sale tomorrow, Ticketmaster at noon. Cool. And uh, Chris Benoit, Steve Regal, Real, William Regal main event? Yes, and the Hardy Boys against X Factor. And we're going to oh, have okay. Torino defend the NWA title for the first time. Oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, Missy Hyatt and Electra. Yes, and you referee now. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that's that's uh, that's no, that's August 9th? That's so August 9th, and of course, Mark Curtis Fantasy Camp. You can read more about that on CurtisCamp.com. That's okay. the day before, on the 8th. We will get you. We will definitely have Les on, you know, a couple of times between now and then. And in fact, we're going to talk. Uh, Les, the next time you're on, we should talk about. You know, uh, Mick Foley wrote a tremendous chapter in his book about uh, Brian Hildebrand, and we should talk about him. I mean, because I, I don't know. I just well, I want to. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, Brian Brian Hildebrand was a very unique guy that that Les and I knew very very well, and um, and Mick Foley knew him better than we did, I think. But yeah. but really, uh. Uh, you know, I mean, you see, many of you saw him as a referee on WCW, but what a what a great, phenomenal wrestling fan, knowledgeable wrestling fan. I mean, he he didn't live in a fantasy world about what wrestling was, but but loved it for both its good and its bad. I mean, really, and 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 what a positive attitude on life. I mean, I mean, I want to tell you something about an, an inspiration. You know, I mean, that's thrown around, but that dude was an inspiration to me. Yes, he was. So, yes, he was. And, um, I mean, so anyway, um. And uh, we'll be back uh, Monday at 5.